gun violence is a huge issue in the Somali community, especially even the minority community. Uh, how do we tackle this issue? Um, so the root cause, <laughs> it's a complicated one, but how do we handle it? I think it was a, an, an epidemiologist who studies um, viruses or diseases. He's a Chicago medical uh, doctor, um, a surgeon, I can't remember his name, but he actually came up with specific steps of how to address. When he came back to his hometown in Chicago, and as you know, Chicago is well known um, for its uh, gun violence. And so he, when he came back to his community, um, he wanted to look at gun violence like a virus which it is, that you do not address gun violence by criminalizing the community and increasing and anyone who's caught with unlicensed gun from seven to 10 to 20 years, that does nothing, right, for the community. Um, or having multiple police and stations nearby the, to the neighborhood. It does, that's not really how you are addressing employment for police officers, uh, employment for and prison guards and building into the prison industrial complex, but you really are not addressing how to eradicate gun violence from the community, how to reduce gun violence from the community. And so his methodology is something that actually has been implemented by different communities in the United States of America and has been successful model because when you look at something as a virus, you can't arrest the virus, right? When you, you're looking at an epidemic, something that is spreading in the community. So then you have to tackle um, the mental health, but you have to tackle also the social network of the community, as well as the income, income and employment. And a good example is Harris government. I was a kid when Harris government was in power. Ontario, it took them how long? Over 20 years to recover from Harris government eliminating a lot of the youth programs that existed in the city of Toronto. And because what youth programs does, what community program do is that it makes, it protects young people from being susceptible to street life. Because many young people don't get into street life because they have a decent wages or decent living or safe communities or safe homes. There's a reason that many of them, because I work with clients in my programs and as a career consultant, and many of them will tell me, if I have a livable wage, I will not be on the streets. I don't want to be on the streets because even though I can make good money temporarily, my quality of life or the fact that I don't know if I'm going to get shot in the next block is not something in which that I want to live, right? So many young people are willing to come off street life if they have an alternative to that street life because ultimately they have to pay rent. Many of them are taking care of families, of kids, whether that's their own biological or their siblings. Many of them are taking care of their parents. So there's a lot of tremendous pressures that is on a lot of young people, especially young black men, to find alternative way of making a living. Right. And because the way in which our communities are extremely deprived of any form of investment, if you're not financially investing intentionally, investing in the black communities in these so-called priority neighborhood or poor neighborhood, then it becomes a cyclical. It, the system will continue. And again, it's a system that is designed. It's, it's not designed to uplift anyone. It's not designed to create an economic mobility, but it's really designed to keep you down, to create a sense of desperation where you constantly, even when you're applying for grant, you are desperate, you're competing, justify yourself to me, justify your blackness to me, justify why you should get this grant. So it's a more of a, like a survival of the fittest mentality, the way in which that we are dealing with our communities and funding allocation. A good example that I will hope Faisal can look into it as an MPP is that the provincial government gave 24 hours notice of eliminating justice programs that houses young people, youth who are in conflict with the law. They gave 24 hours. So what, what it meant is that in Northern Ontario, indigenous kids and black kids were suddenly taken out of their home, put in an airplane without any notification to their parents. And their parents found out afterward where they're gonna be housed somewhere so far away from their home. You know, things like that, if you really care about gun violence, other than creating militarized police so they can continue to harass and arrest and criminalize and black youth, the way that you go about your priority. So they, all they wanted to do is eliminate save $25 million 
But that $25 million could have been utilized differently into address gun violence, into address community need and young people. So they don't have to be intergenerationally in the system, in the criminal justice system, continue to be there until adulthood, all the way even that their children will end up in the system. Because guess what? If you are in conflict with the law, the likelihood of your child becoming in conflict with the law is extremely high. Many people who are being incarcerated, their children will be incarcerated. If you've ever come across children in society, you are more likely to be incarcerated. You are more likely as a black youth to end up in the street life and to intersex trade, specifically for young black women. So there's so many other elements that kind of build onto each other because of people just look at the gun violence, that kind of a immediate violence, but what are the consequences of government? Why do they exist? Another issue is the easy, cheap access. Like I remember when I was growing up, it was hell expensive to get a gun, but now it's extremely cheap. So it's saturated into the market. No one is dealing with how do they end up? Who is benefiting? Because it's not black communities. Who is benefiting? Who is at the border that are letting these guns in? Who is letting these guns into the community? There's not much of an actual supervisory investigation of to look at the source. It's like drugs. How do drugs get into communities? No one looks at that. They only look about who's using the drugs and how can we arrest them and incarcerate them. 